Hi, everyone. It's Marilyn Alori, and welcome to Who Can It Be Now? I always say this. It's a very special podcast, but today is a very special podcast. I'm interviewing Michael Fishman. And here's the thing about Michael. So Michael, I think I can say this, right? That you were a client of mine, that you came to me for readings. Can I say that? Yeah. I didn't ask him much <laughs> what I can say and what I can't say. Um, and he contacted me through Instagram. We had a conversation and I didn't, I didn't know who he is. I never know who anybody is. And, uh, we were just starting to talk and then we did, I did a reading for him. And at first I was very hesitant to do the reading because I was getting to know him a little bit in Instagram. And I was like, Ooh, I don't know if this guy, like how he's going to be in a reading. I don't know what he's going to be like. And I'm really about acceleration and everything. And then I did the reading for him and I, it was the first reading I decided to do again after coming out of retirement of readings. And he blew me away in his energy. He blew me away with everything that he possessed, the gifts, the talent, the unique qualities, the person that he is, his soul. And I was like, oh my goodness. And and Michael, I don't even know if he knows this, that after that reading, I was in touch with another person who's actually, they're both in Hollywood business. And I was like, you know, I'm so glad that the two of you came forward and asked me to do a reading because you were the perfect people to do. And it wasn't just about, you know, the simple questions that I don't really like answering, like, is this girl love me? Or am I going to get married? Or what's the numbers of the lottery or things like that? It was more very soulful. And Michael was able to meet me on the path. So since then, we've had a conversation and Michael is part of Next Level Living and I'm getting to know him more and more. And I just truly, truly adore him. And um, so I don't know a lot about his life. And I didn't know he was the, what was the character's name you played in Roseanne? It was the son. Was uh, it DJ Connor? Yeah, DJ. I played the son. So he played the son in Roseanne. I didn't know because I never know who anybody is and I don't Google them. And my assistant at the time, Laura, was like, do you know he played DJ in Roseanne? I'm like, no, I have no idea who he is. <laughs> so I'm going to ask him questions about that, but we're also going to just take this ride. So thank you, Michael, for being here. Yeah, it's it's a pleasure. I have to tell people, uh, you don't brag enough about you. Uh, so I'm going to a little bit uh, I find you to be incredibly heartfelt and soulful and there's a kindness in your guiding, but you're also fearless. And I think that's a beautiful combination. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to blush now. Tell me about where you were born, like where you grew up and how you got into acting. So I was born in Long Beach, California. Uh, my sister actually wanted to earn money for college uh, when she was very young. So she started auditioning and I would end up going along for the ride. Both my parents worked and had normal jobs and we had zero connection to this crazy industry and so they'd start asking like are you here for this audition and at first they're saying no and then finally I turned to my parents and said well I'd like to audition and ironically it was 1988 and there was a huge writer strike so there was no work oh. and my my parents were adamant that we could only audition for commercials they didn't want us to do anything long term because they both had very busy normal jobs and this audition came up for uh, a show called Life and Stuff, which would later become Roseanne. And the agent said, can you take him? My parents said, absolutely not. We already told you nothing long term. And they said, well, he'll never get it. They only want somebody with experience. We just take him. And we went and it was it's one of those. It's one of the first times in my life where you just know you're supposed to be somewhere. Mm. And your intuition really kicks in. We walked in. Um. Uh, and I walked upstairs, I, I met a man named Jeff Thomas, who was like the receptionist at the time, and we're still friends, you know, 35 years later. And I literally turned to my mom when I walked out, she was horrified, because I said, so when are they going to call about my job? And it was a massive surge, over 10,000 kids, maybe more, um, seven auditions spanning six months, we did everything wrong you could in the process. But on the second interview, I met Roseanne. And she and I hit it off and she kind of pushed for me the rest of the way. And, you know, you, my parents plan for nothing long-term turned into nine years of, of joy and learning and chaos and excitement. Wow. I never, ever knew that story. It's amazing. Um, what did your, what were your parents' reaction when you got the job? Like, did they say, was there a discussion about whether you should take it or not? Or are we going to do this or not? Well, in the middle of the audition process, um, like about the third audition, they said, you know, got to do a callback on Thursday. And my mom's like, I can't, I'm a nurse and I work in a hospital, so I'm unavailable. So they're like, we'll move it. And then the last audition, we spent every summer in Virginia 
where my mom's family's from and we were supposed to go on a family trip. So my family's like, well, I guess he didn't get it because we have to go out of town. And they're like, well, if you'll stay in town, we'll fly Michael and one of one of you, one of the parents back after the audition because we're going to make a decision. And at first my family said no. And then actually my dad stayed in town with me. And I remember, you know, I, this is one of those like being a little bit of a scamp and a, and a play, I like kind of raised the stakes because I was like, I knew I was getting my job. Like there was no question in my mind. So I was like, hey, if I get this job, can I, I wanted this huge GI Joe plane. And, and we didn't get a lot of toys. My, we lived very modestly. So my dad was like, sure, if you get it, yeah, whatever. So I just remember we got the job. So on the way home, we stopped at Toys R Us, picked up this giant uh, airplane. And then we called my mom on the East Coast and I got to tell her I got the job. And it was a mix of, she was very polite, but there was clearly some horror on the other end of the phone. And then my dad had to explain to her the information which we didn't know at the time, which is they had already sold the pilot. Oh, wow. And so it was for 13 episodes. So we were going straight to series. So it wasn't even like, hey, you got a job and you might turn into something like this is like, hey, he got the job and it's going to turn into something big. That's insane. Now, as it's so people don't know this about you, but I do. And well, maybe they do, because I know you're very open about your life. You're a sensitive person. You're an intuitive person. At You were what, six years old when this happened? Yeah. Were you feeling this layers or what as a sensitive being, at least what you can know who you are now and what you were then, were you experiencing any type of like sensitivity to your parents' lives and how it might shift them? Or was your main focus like, this is my job. I'm supposed to do this. This is the path. Like what was going on in your little being? You know, I think you bury this sometimes. You mm. know, and it was so clear then I was... My parents used to do this thing where I wasn't allowed to ask about my job until Friday because there was like a month or two months at a time where it would just be radio silence. Oh, yeah. And then they would call and they'd call the agent. The agent would call the company. They say, nope, see, he's still in the running. And my parents, I could tell and feel that my parents had anxiety over it and they kind of regretted going down this path. And it got really complex because in my family, um, I had an aunt, my dad's sister-in-law actually introduced us to our agent. And one of the things she said in the process was, if you'll take him, if he ever was to get it, I'll help you. Because my kids have done stuff like we'll, we'll help right as a family. But then that never happened. Mm. And that created massive chaos in my family going forward. And there, you know, after getting the job, it, it became a huge source of conflict. And it really like, you know, it fractured my family in a lot of ways. So I was very sensitive to kind of the impact it was having on everyone. And in particular, the impact it had on my older sister who had wanted to do commercials and stuff. And suddenly this path is, I was on the path I was meant to be on, but that meant that my path was kind of eclipsing hers. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I was curious. Like if you were picking that up and that's pretty impact, uh, that's, that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay. So you're on the show for nine years. I don't want to go too much into that. I may have you back on to talk about that because I know, what do you think are the two biggest lessons you learned from being on that show? And I know there's many, Michael is a very deep, um, deep soul. So he's got a lot and he's so talented and creative. My two biggest ones. Um, the first one is probably use your voice Mm. to actually be cognitive and think about how you want to use your voice, like use your voice in society. If you're given a platform and as you grow your platform to make sure that you're mindful of how you use your voice. And I had to be the spokesperson for the show through some chaos. I mean, after the national anthem incident, and then later on when, when there was other chaos. So I've tried to be very conscious of what my voice is and be consistent and authentic in that. Um, And then I think the second one I learned, I kind of, you meander a little. I, I think I became much more professional is a great thing, but don't lose your playfulness and your creativity mm-hmm. and your intuition, right? Sometimes you can almost structure that stuff out of you. And so, you know, don't be afraid to take that daring, bold step. Don't be afraid to share a dream that other people think is crazy. I think if you're really sharing an authentic dream, uh, everybody else is not supposed to get it. 
You're not supposed to be able to see it. It's yours. So now I do want to go here. So we're going to talk about this. When you were on the show, when did you have a realization? Well, when did the show hit? Did it hit right away? I don't yeah. remember. It yeah. did. It, uh, I think we debuted at like number eight. We were number one within like two months and everything changed. Everywhere we went, you know, this was a, a mass. I mean, we were pulling you know, 24 million households or, you know, wow. numbers that are like absurd now, like almost Super Bowl numbers. Wow. So how did that shift you and your family or you with your family and then your, your relationship with your sister, if you can say that, I don't know if you can or not, because that a protection for her. No, I mean, my sister and I, I mean, there's always siblings have complex relationships. It's the nature yeah. of it. But I would say I was very cognizant and I knew that there were elements of it that were hard, but it also was elements of great joy, right? And opportunities to do things. So I always tried to be very mindful and we actually have a really good relationship. And I've mm -hmm. always tried to make sure that as I went or as I grew or opportunities came that I shared some of those. Like when she went to get ready to go to college, half the colleges she toured, she came with me on a press event. And then she and my dad would go tour the colleges so she got to see a lot of parts of the country and do things. So there was always a benefit mm -hmm. that I think went along with it. I, I know that there were moments that were hard, but there always are going to be those. Um, as far as for me, like the nature of the show, like instantaneously, like I've never had a private life. I've never had anonymity. Um, and I think for most people, that kind of drives people crazy. I think I took a unique view on it, which was, it really is a great way to force you to have to be authentic if you're willing, because I never mm -hmm. put on a persona. I think that's where people go wrong is people decide what's cool, who they think they want to be, who they think the world wants them to be. And for me, my parents did a good job of keeping me somewhat humbled in that sense is I stayed at the same public school on the days and weeks I wasn't working. I still played sports. I did a lot of the stuff in the same area. So I never totally lost touch with my my community or where I, I started. Was that a conscious decision you made inside yourself or it was just the way that you were raised because you were nor they were normalizing you to some degree, even though you were in this like spectacular experience? I think it's a combination. I think my parents okay. did a good job of like, my, my dad's a hard old school guy. He immigrated here and- uh, Where did he immigrate from? Uh, he was born in China and then grew up in Israel and oh, wow. the United States. So he has a really complex background. Yeah. And then my mom was born on a little tiny farm with no running water and no electricity in the middle of the mountains in Virginia. So you couldn't get any further from this it, crazy magical life that I've had, but it gave me a great base. And I would tell you, I made a lot of early decisions in my life, probably because I was around adults who made me think of things in a different way. But I was very conscious of like, you're really lucky for what you do, but it's just a job. It's a public job, so you have to respect that and understand the responsibilities that come with it, but it doesn't make you better than anybody else. Mm. So when, how old were you when the show finished? Uh, 15. And did you continue on to acting? Did you continue with acting? What happened during that period of time? Well, it's a huge transition. You know, but you, I was going to say that must have been, was that very sad for you? Because after being nine years, this becomes a family pretty much. Yeah. And for me, especially because I was connected to everybody. I've never had a, I'm not a hierarchical person. So even on cruise now, whether it be as an actor or a director, or writer, producer, like I want to know what everybody does. I care about the crew and, and the production staff and all that stuff. So that was my family. And what I would say, you know, I've realized in the last couple of years in particular, like being on set, there's the closest I've ever really had to home. Mm. And that's the closest thing I've had to the type of community I wanted. So when it ended, I had a beautiful foreshadowing, which um, after season eight, we didn't know if we were coming back. And I spent that whole summer, first of all, I grew like six inches and my whole body transformed. But also I spent that whole summer really contemplating all the things I left unsaid mm. and how much I loved everybody. So I probably scared that hell out of people if I'm being totally honest because I came back season nine to make sure everybody knew I I lost a lot of people in my life I've lost a, a tremendous amount of people 
and it gave me great perspective on life and how precious life is and temporary. So that ninth year, I didn't want to leave anything unsaid. I, I've lived this life where I, I tell people how I feel. I'm very open about how I feel about things. I'm somewhat blunt, and I'm also very particular about I don't forget to tell somebody if they do something great or that I love them or how important they are to me. So I wrote pretty much everybody a letter. Uh, everybody got these like two or three page things about kind of all the things that they had instilled in me over the course of those years. And it was important for me to kind of let people know the impact they had. How was that received? It's a mix. You know, I, I mean, yeah. I was a crying fool that last day. Like yeah. I, I've never had emotion like that. It came out in such a way. And again, my dad's an old school, tough guy. You know, this is a, a veteran of the U S army and the Israeli army. Um, he is hard. And I was raised not to cry and not to be very emotional. And it's really interesting because I had this crazy emotional experience that last week working on the show and then could not cry for like 15 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like I was, like, it's like it came out and then I could not, I had no emotion I could show. And at times there were times in my life where I was like, man, I, I cannot express this the way I need. Now, do you, do you think for people I saw, so I worked in TV and it wasn't the same as you, but behind the scenes. And when you work on a crew, you do become very MTV was like that for us. We were a tight knit, we're a family. We're still very close. Um, especially during the period of time I worked and I even meet other people who know about like this group of MTV people were just very strong and tight knit. And it is when I left MTV, the first time I left, it was a hole in my heart. It was very difficult. So I can only relate a tiny bit to what your experience was. So my question to you was, what about that experience? And I want to explain that to other people because they don't know what it's like to work in an atmosphere where you're First of all, Michael, I don't know if you've had this experience, but with the lines, like you said it, it was home to you. So the lines get blurred from Especially actual, as a kid. Yeah. From reality to uh, illusion or whatever. But that probably felt even better at times than your own home life. Or yeah, did it? They did. And it sounds crazy because we were, you know, we're notorious. Our set was the most chaotic and like, um, the stories are kind of legendary and people still to this day are like, did this really happen? And the answer is yes, but we we're also incredibly professional and we mm. were so loving. It was kind of an us against the world element at times. And we, you know, in 1990, she sang the national anthem. What everybody else got after 9-11 with metal detectors and all that stuff, we got when I was like eight, nine years old, we got metal detectors and bomb sniffing dogs and we had death threats and and is this really what you want right like i had this crazy beautiful chaotic um unbelievable experience and then you come to the end of that and it's not it's not anyone's fault right as an adult you understand when a job ends or a project ends, you move on and everybody kind of scatters in a million directions because you all have to find work and, and you have to move on. But as a teenager, as a kid, when this is your, that's the closest I had to the type of family I wanted outside of what I built later with my own kids, that was home. It was yeah. the safe space. And as crazy as it sounds, you know, we did episodes about like cutting up baby dolls and masturbation and like things that were horribly embarrassing like but I was fearless on set and kind of still am and I you know it sounds really weird to people who haven't experienced it but like the smell of an old sound stage like that's yeah. home to me right there's all these little subtle cues and I feel like I my light shines almost brightest in that place and I love to bring people together so god I love set I love what we get to do. And the end of that was gut-wrenching and heartbreaking and um, literally almost destroyed me. Like I was in a really dark place and it was such a crash. Um, and, and then kind of everybody tells you they're going to be there for you. And they mean that. And it really made me conscious as a, as a young person and as an adult, especially when I talk to children. Um, I coach kids and I've done a lot of stuff in the community. 
because I remember what it was like to have all these people tell me that they love me and that they'll be there for me. And then for all of them to go away. Mm -hmm. And so I have made this conscious decision that if I make a commitment like that to a child, that it's a one-way commitment and that I will be the person who maintains and stands in and is that consistent, secure, dependable person. Okay. Now I understand. I understand that completely. And now I understand a piece of what I know about your life, which, um, so why it's so hard for you when a child is in your life, if the mm -hmm. child is no longer in your life, you really feel that's that separation. And you also really feel that your responsibility is to always be there for that child. If you're committed to it, is that correct? Oh, a hundred percent. Um, yeah. And I, I don't have a, I don't have a halfway and, and I'll give you, I never really talk about it much. So I'll kind of, you know, my dad was very hard and my dad was, a, it's a, my way or the, or the highway kind of situation. And my dad and I butted heads because I was in an adult world having incredible success. And after Roseanne, I worked on Seinfeld and I, I did a movie with Steven Spielberg and like, I did a bunch of stuff right after. So it doesn't get any bigger than this. You know, I've shared room or stages with like some of the biggest people and I emceed a bunch of concerts with some amazing like my life <laughs> makes no sense to the outside world because it's on such a different timeline but I learned so many lessons but when I was a teenager you know my dad kind of did this thing where he had been pushed out of his house as a teenager so he kind of did the same thing mm. and, and he didn't know how and I remember one night um getting kicked out and I had my cast and crew list uh, and I had $20 and I went to a pay phone that was next to a bus stop. I had a pager tells you time period. And I started working my way down the list, calling people because I had nowhere to go. And I'll never forget because, you know, I, I probably used about $18, probably called 60, close to 70 people. And then you wait in this moment, you know, this is, about a year after the show and you're waiting for the pager to go off and there's nothing lonelier in the old days than to wait and hope a payphone's going to ring or that your pager is going to go off. And then there was a real reality that no one is coming to save you. Mm. And I got on the bus and uh, the last bus came and the driver must have heard, they must have talked about it because he pulled up. He's like, are you getting on? Because it was like, I don't know, probably close to midnight. And he's like, are you getting on the bus? Because this is the last one. And I'm like, sure. So I got on, gave basically whatever was left of, of the money for my bus fare and sat on the bus because I hadn't ridden a public bus really much in my life. And I just rode it and rode it until we got basically to the end. And he pulled over and he's like, I have to take the bus back. And I'll never forget because he gave me, um, it makes me emotional now, like, he gave me basically his lunch. He gave me this tuna fish uh, sandwich, which I don't eat, and an apple and said, I can't take you with me. I have to take the bus back. And I got off um, pretty close to downtown and just walked because I had nowhere to go. And I tell people, while that sounds like a horribly painful thing, man, I learned so much about me. And that real brief time period of not having a home shaped me in a lot of ways. So that is a very vulnerable moment that you're reaching out to a bunch of people. Did anybody respond or no? No. no. Um, and it's not about, that's about like your experience, right? They didn't respond, but if you're leading with that much vulnerability, asking for help, did that shut you down to ask for help in the future or to be vulnerable in the future? What did that do to you? How did it shape your life? It's really interesting. I made it, and I'm not really sure when I made this decision, but it was before that, but this reinforced it is I've always had this belief that um, people, I, I know what cruelty looks like. It's one of the reasons I'm so kind. And for me, I had this really conscious thought that night of like, look, other people have stuff going on in their life. Other people have stuff that you can't see. So most of these people probably don't fully grasp what's going on. And now that I look back at it, I don't even know how much I verbalized in some of those, I, you know, because I was panicked and everything else and kind yeah. of overwhelmed. But the thing I've always thought is 
you know what i've been burned and betrayed and and known a lot of chaos and a lot of trauma and what i would tell people is i made a decision early might not be for everybody but it is my belief and i live this way is i would rather give someone the benefit of the doubt and get burned i would rather live with an open heart and not miss out on a good person and take the chance on loving people than to protect myself in such a way that i close myself off and i remember you know i have a real clear defining moment of like the person that i became as an adult who was born one night sitting under a bridge thinking about i tell people all the time pick your adjectives you get to choose the words people use about you and that night it some of those people were the motivation for who i wanted to be and still are like some of the people i worked with instilled the most beautiful traits in me i'm a combination of those people and i you know 20 something years later i get to work with them again in 2017 when we come back and i think a lot of them kept saying to me we're so happy how how <laughs> how good you turned out and the truth is like bits and pieces of that are from them and i learned both the lessons from the things they didn't do well, but I also adapted all the things that I thought were beautiful about people. Such a big consciousness. I want to talk about that, but I want to ask you because in me, so how long were you on your own? What did you do after that moment? I've been thrown out of my, I was thrown out of my house twice. So, but for me, and it's a very scary moment getting thrown out, but I was in my neighborhood. I was able to go to certain places, somebody took me in right away. And then the second time a friend took me in. Um, I can't I was, imagine walking around, not having any place to go. Yeah. I was really efficient. Um, I was defiant. I, I think that's one I'm, you know, I try to use the word relentless. It's one of my words. Um, and for me, I was like, okay, I need to make a little bit of money. And in those days I was like, okay, gym memberships are cheap. That's a place I can, take a shower, get clean. Like, mm -hmm. okay, I only have a couple outfits. So that was the other part. Like I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to figure out how I'm going to go to school, trying to figure out how to go. You know, I went to an audition one time and like had to go to the, the laundromat and wash my clothes, uh, went to school for a little while and only had a couple of outfits. I basically wore the same thing all week in the same sequence. Right. And like, you start thinking, do people notice? Like there's all these things that where, will forever change where were you sleeping uh, i depended you know um wherever i could at one point i tried to go to, like missions i think are great but it's a mix and when you're on your own like if you've collected anything it means you have to leave your stuff behind a lot of times and then mm -hmm. you come back and it's you know someone else has used your stuff or you know people do horrible things to it so but really early on, I found a family. I, you know, I met a, a friend. Actually, I lived in in Compton with a family that you know took me in and talk about culture shock and like being in a very different environment. But what I also found was that there were a lot of beautiful people in the world, and I just kind of slowly rebuilt. Then I came back. I got some work, and then work led me back to the house for a little while, and then you know, I'd get kicked out again as a teenager. I left for a while. At one point I had an apartment and kind of like got, I was living with like seven other people in a tiny little, like almost studio apartment. And, you know, I built myself a bed out of like two by fours and, you know, plywood, but you just make do. Um, and I kind of always knew what I wanted to do, but in my world, nobody wanted me to work in entertainment. Even the people I grew up with, like mm -hmm. everybody's like, you're, you're too smart. You're too logical. Like you can do so many other things. Go, go do something normal. But it was also denying the part of my soul that this is That's, part of that light. It is your normal. Yeah. Hollywood is your normal. Entertainment is your normal. Acting, writing, directing, everything that you do is your normal. It's who you are. And yeah, it's so much more. Away. What? And you can't run away from it. No. So it you know, year after year, you know, like opportunities would come. Like I said, next thing I know, I'm doing this episode of Seinfeld, right? And it, and I got this job on a show called Hits with Andrew Dice Clay. And this is, to me, I think this is the best. If someone wants to know what's our entertainment industry like, um, I had just gotten a place to, to sleep. Uh, Monday, I audition, I get hired. 
Tuesday, they're like, you're really amazing. Do you want to be a recurring character? Cause we think you're so amazing. And you're like, yeah, of course, what, what a beautiful <laughs> gift right now. So now I'm thinking I'm going to be able to like afford to live, live. And after a while, like I'm thinking, Oh, I can help people. And, uh, Wednesday we do this, uh, run through for the network and I'm a huge hit and it's this beautiful thing. And they're like, Hey, can we have a meeting? They're like, we're thinking, would you want to be a series regular and stay on the show and just be part of the show? And, I, and I'm like, of course, I'm like, you know, <laughs> lightning is striking again, right? Like literally the so Thursday we go into this thing. Uh, I do contract negotiations and they're like, okay, so we're going to announce that you're going to be a permanent part of the show tomorrow night at dinner before we tape in front of the audience. And then you'll sign your contract after the show. Mm. Fantastic. Friday we come, we start filming all the scenes. And then at dinner, they call a meeting. And it was when uh, UPN and um, and Warner Brothers combined to make the CW or whatever. And we were one of the shows that got canceled. So that night before the audience show, the show gets canceled. So here you are, got a dream, life's all good. Oh my God, your dream just got even better than you could imagine. Oh, by the way, it just disappeared. Wow. And the one of the parts was because I hadn't signed the contract yet. Yeah, I was going to say, I, that's why when they said that, it's like, next time you know, give me the contract <laughs> yeah, now. We're not exactly. signing it later. Let's give me that contract. <laughs> exactly. And so- that's, I was like sitting on the edge of my <laughs> contract. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I was like, so everybody else got paid for the rest of that season or whatever. And you know, I walked out of that with the best advice I think I've ever gotten, which is from a-, a friend, a dear friend named Reno Wilson, who's an amazing actor, mm -hmm. who gave this speech and said to everybody, look, this audience is going to come in. We're all meant to do this. We just might not be meant to do it here. Mm, beautiful. So, so be great at what you do because that audience has no idea what happened. And probably no one will ever see what we did tonight, right? But we know and that audience will know and they deserve for us to do our best. And he was right. And it's something I've carried with me ever since. Yeah, but I have a question. So I didn't we, I didn't know I was going to go down this road, but um, I'm really curious about this. So I'm going to share real quick a story. I was up for a TV show. I was at the, we were doing the testing. And um, so all day, it was all day testing, all day, you know, trying the different combinations and everything and then bringing me in. And, you know, it was going to be me, a magician, but there was other like mediums there and all of that. And it was so, it was already sold the show. And then I heard nothing about it, nothing about it. And you're like waiting and waiting and waiting. And then I walked into a beauty parlor and this woman's like, oh my goodness, I know you. You were like, I edited you for that piece and you were like going to be the lead of it. And they were doing it around you, but they decided not to go with it. I think I did find out that they weren't going for it. It was so disappointing to know that I didn't get it. How was it for you? And how did you deal with that disappointment? And how did you not let that disappointment, I'm going to give you a lot of questions, Michael, not dictate the rest of your life? Because that's the important thing. I mean, you're on this scale up and then you get this huge disappointment at a time in your life and you really need it. Yeah, but I think I think part of that's life. I mean, I, I think some part of this is, you know, rejection is redirection which people mm. have said very wisely. And I, you know, what Reno said really was something I carried and I've carried for years. We joke about it now, 20 plus years later of like, he was right. We were all supposed to do this thing. We just weren't supposed to do it there. And, and mm. this place ended. But if it's your dream and you really love it, just because someone tells you no, they're not telling you, no, you're not worthy or no, you're not good enough. They're telling you, not right here or not right now. And this business is full of rejection. I mean, mm -hmm. I've had roles that I wanted. Um, the first one that comes to mind whenever anybody asks is I so badly, I knew Robin Williams and had spent some time with him and he was like a hero. Mm -hmm. Listen, I auditioned for Mrs. Doubtfire. And ironically, someone that I beat out for the job on Roseanne ended up getting that part in Mrs. Doubtfire and doing that role. And it's like, do I wish I didn't get one versus the other? No, I, what's meant for me will come to me. And I have to just kind of understand that I might not always see all the pieces, but the question is really what I learned from it. Like that was a great experience for me. It was, it, it also reminded me that, Hey, you can do this on a, on a high level, 
you can go from being the guy that no one expected to the guy people want. So there were lots of good things about it. And that did, didn't help my bank account and didn't pay any bills. And, yeah. and sometimes that's, you know, that becomes part of the journey. Did that freak you out though? You know, you're like, oh my goodness, now how am I going to pay my bills? Were you having anxiety? Were you experiencing any anxiety? I, you know, I've lived so basically, Marilyn, like I don't live by money. It's never been my thing. Um, and, and there is some privilege in that is I've always found a way. I, and that's one of those things I, I can't really explain to people is it's not how I define my life. Um, I've, I've never really fought over it. It's cost me a lot somewhere along the way. There have been times where I've been cheated on contracts and people haven't honored things. And, you know, now as I get a little older, you know, like I should be a lot more comfortable. I should be in a much better place financially. And the truth is you can be bitter about it. I look at it. The opposite is, first of all, it's kind of like monopoly money because I never had it. So mm. losing it is somewhat kind of, it doesn't really matter in the sense, but the other part is man, it kept me hungry. And I'm hungry in a way now, as long as I never let my kids down, that's the thing for me. As long, like my kids have never known what it's like to be hungry or not to have the things they want. So to me, that's success and everything else is kind of a bonus. Yeah. And money is just energy. So I like what you said. And, um, but there's something you, now I can't recall it. So I'll write it down next time. So it doesn't matter. But very good. I love the lessons that you've learned. I love the consciousness you've had throughout these experiences. I want to move to your adult life. But before we do that, I have, I want to know, were you raised with any type of spirituality? Because all of this has a spiritual tilt to it. So did, were you raised with any spirituality? Yeah, I grew up, my house was, it was a bit of a complex thing because my dad's Jewish um, mm. and my mom was not. So I was raised very much like I spent a lot of time in temple, but I had a lot of religious trauma along the way. I had a lot of not ideal situations. When my family fractured, temple was the place that people fought and the people fought with me. Um, and then, you know, you get a little older in the Jewish faith. Like if your mom is not Jewish, then yeah. at one point they tell you you're not, which I have this thing of like, you don't get to tell me what my belief is in my faith. I think we we put too much stock in people in funny hats and, and certain wardrobes, sometimes their opinions, as opposed to actually tapping into our faith. So I have a very strong moral compass and sense of, of kind of divinity and spirituality, but it's not as structured as in, probably in the way other people might have theirs. What do you believe? Do you believe it's God, universe? What do you it, believe in? Yeah. And I think I'm smart enough to realize that I don't have to have all the answers, but I don't have to have I think we spend too much time arguing about the name and not enough time actually honoring the spirituality and the divinity of it. And I think for me, that's been the thing is, you know, I still every once in a while, I go to temple, you know, I was just there yesterday, uh, but I, I spent a lot of time as a teenager, you know, the family, they took me in, made me go to church every Sunday. And I loved going to a Baptist church and listening to the music and the choir and I think all spirituality is beautiful as long as it's not used in some kind of um, kind of abrupt or harsh way to to limit other people. Why do you believe, where do you believe that you came from? Where do you think you came from onto this planet and why are you here? Well, I think we all come from kind of this divine space. I think souls are very uh, particular, you know, I, I don't know how much we come back or, you know, I, I think I'm wise enough to, to know I don't have all of those answers. But what I would say is we don't stop. I think your loved ones you can reach out to at any time. You know, I, I hear enough and know enough and see enough that I realize there's so much more, you know, than just the physical stuff. Um, and then what I would say is it really is about having this kind of knowing and honest connection. You know, I think people mistake, you don't have to think of divinity and then that doesn't mean energy doesn't exist or it doesn't mean if you love the universe and you look at it from a universal perspective. I find it so bizarre. If you're a religious person, you believe that we were created and I kind of come from more of that background. Mm -hmm. If you're a scientific person, you believe everything evolved. And then if you're more ethereal and you believe in kind of energy and you believe in this kind of cosmic connection and energy element, we're all saying the same thing. I don't know why we're really fighting over it. We're, we're, 
fighting over the semantics, which is a great way to separate people from actually just sharing in the divinity and the beautiful spirituality of have faith, be kind, do things for other and be open to the energy that there are things bigger than you and that you should want to tap into the things that are bigger than you and you should want to help other people reach and, and achieve. So why do you think you're here? What do you, what's your purpose for today? We're not going to talk about your life's purpose. We can, you can sometimes summarize it, but it always have a, I don't believe in just one purpose. I believe, I believe in a feeling, a belief, something that we live by. I believe that one of my biggest things is to help people believe in the dreams in their heart and to live them. And then how I do that is a different thing. You know, each iteration of my life, whatever. So I want to hear about yours. Yeah, well, I think if I, you have that. You know me, Michael. I'm very open to other people's beliefs, so I don't care what people believe. Yeah, in. well, me too. And I and I actually love like I, you and I share this. I I do believe that people should get their dreams, and I do believe in helping people achieve them. So I do want to be a launching ground for people. Mm. I want to build access and inclusion. Um, when we do entertainment right. It's the most beautiful business in the world. It's magical. We get to make things that impact people and can lift people. When people do it with hierarchies and, and ego and destruction, it becomes very ugly at times and you hear those horrible stories. And I've known both. So what I would say is from a professional standpoint, it's to be a storyteller, to share some of my wisdom and spirituality and awareness and kind of find it into my projects, but more importantly, to take people and uplift them and help them share their own stories and, and empower people to make beautiful shared collaborative experiences without it having to be torturous or negative or without anybody being abused in the process. I think artists, sometimes their good hearts get taken advantage of um, on a more personal level I'm here to be a son and a and a brother and a partner and a dad. I'm here to be a support structure, to be the dependable, loving person that you can always come to, to be the person you call at two o'clock in the morning when things go horribly wrong that will always show up and to love you and to love in kind of a I don't always love the word unconditional way, but in a in a very authentic and heartfelt kind of unconditional manner of I don't always need people to reciprocate and I don't always have to have people stay in life. My job is to love in a certain way and help people kind of heal in the time that they need me. Don't you think the, and you tell me what you think, the storyteller in you also gets carried into the personal when you're, you know, somebody's calling you at 2 a.m. and you're supporting them or you're teaching your kids or your partner, you're helping a partner through something. Do you believe the storyteller still is present in your personal life? Always. Um, yeah. And I think vice versa. I think the life informs my storytelling because I mm -hmm. want to tell authentic, heartfelt stories. I want to, I have very, very background. I have adopted kids. You know, I've spent time in, I also don't like injustice and I don't like um, exclusionary practices. So some portion of my writing and storytelling gives me the opportunity to explore and share some of the things I've seen, you know, hope is a big thing to me. And I think if you have faith and you have a spirituality, it helps with your hope. But I think a lot of people in society are kind of losing their hope. And I, I find that to be very disheartening. So my personal goal is to not only inspire some of that hope, but show people some of the ways that I found it along the way in the darkest moments and build family. I think family is bigger than genetics or shared material, right? Family is the people that you come together with. So I try mm -hmm. to build family and community and love. I think we underestimate and we overuse the word, but underestimate the action of love. Is Hollywood ready? And I say Hollywood as a term, just so people understand it, you know, so I, I don't know how to say it any other way. Is the world ready? Hmm, how do I ask this question? Are people ready to see your stories, to hear your stories, to feel your stories, to experience your stories? Yeah. I, and I think if they weren't, I wouldn't be here right now. But the other part is how much people are ready, right? And that's and part of my my test right like i have to help open the door and help share things and make it receptive to people like that's the other part if you have a belief 
I don't help somebody believe by ramming it to them or, or forcing them. Are they ready? Well, sometimes you have to kick in the doors a little bit and, you know, can't get in the door, you get in the window if you can't, right? Like you have to make these spaces. So we're not always ready until something arrives, right? Sometimes we use words like trigger as a negative thing, but there's lots of positive triggers. Mm -hmm. And so I would tell you, yeah, I'm armed and ready to do things a little differently. And that's scary. I'm a little disruptive and I'm unconventional and you can use any word you want, weird, strange, odd. Um, I will fail along the way, which I think a lot of people are afraid of. Mm -hmm. But in order to shine, you have to be willing to walk through all of that. And I think what I am more than anything is relentless and undetoured. I like, I, I don't lose my enthusiasm for this, regardless of what pain I experience along the way. And I think that's maybe the greatest source of kind of optimism in my life. Yeah, I love that answer because who cares whether they're ready or not? Because they, you have to show they're going to, when they see what you have to offer, it's going to be as they continue to see what you have to offer, I should say, because you're already doing what you're doing. Um, when I, I tap in everywhere, like what did you say? I, and I won't fit everywhere. No, none of us do. Part. And that's okay too. Like it some is. people are not ready to share in that journey. Sometimes you work in a place, I've had this experience where they decide, that no matter how, and it's funny because I usually leave places where they tell me how much they love me or how kind I was or how wonderful it was to work with me, but they're going a different direction. That's their deal. I have yeah. to go build mine other places then. Yeah, it's so true. And that's why we have to really embrace who we are at the core and the evolution of who we are. Because you calling me kind, most people on a tennis court would not use that word for me. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, People tell me I'm kind too, but if you play me in a competitive environment, that's not exactly the place, you know, I was, and I was a coach for a long time. I don't know that the people I coached against thought I was kind. That's great. Um, I, I want to start wrapping it up, but there, I, I, I have a couple of questions and one question I'm going to ask, and it may be too big of a question to ask. So we'll see, 